everyone. Welcome to our first book talk of 2022. Today also happens to be Gutman Library's 50th birthday. So happy birthday, Gutman. Before we begin, I would like to remind you to enter your questions into the Q&A feature, which will be active throughout the event. Today's program features Marilyn Brookwood, psychologist and historian who will discuss her book, The Orphans of Davenport, Eugenics, the Great Depression, and the War Over Children's Intelligence. Marilyn is a scholar who excavated the nearly unknown events of how it was discovered that environment changes children's intelligence. She will be joined by Mary Bennett, the head of special collections at the State Historical Society of Iowa. Mary is a historian of Iowa life, noted for her book, An Iowa Album, A Photographic History, 1850 to 1920. Mary has worked for five decades in special collections at the State Historical Society of Iowa and has said, there are literally millions of pieces of history in the State Historical Society's collections and every one of them has a story. First, we'll hear from Marilyn. Thanks, Mayanne. As we begin today, I want to thank Mayanne Privoche of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Gutman Library, who generously invited me to talk with you and Mary Bennett, Special Collections Coordinator at the State Historical Society of Iowa in Iowa City for her remarkable scholarship about Iowa. Appearing at Hugsey, where I studied and researched early development, lectured to ed school students, and engaged in endless conversations and discussions about the Iowa Station's history is a thrill. In telling the story of the orphans of Davenport, I hope to highlight something of Hugsey's mission, learn to change the world. And in case you're wondering, I'm not from Iowa. I'm just a poor country girl from Brooklyn, New York. But once I discovered the little known story of how the Great Depression and the eugenics era altered the fates of Davenport, Davenport's orphans, and in doing so changed the history of psychology, there was no going back. The story had to be told. Piecing together this history of the orphans of Davenport exposed a mystery. How did a group of unknown psychologists studying children who lived in a destitute Great Depression era institution make the historic discovery that environment changed children's cognitive abilities at the time, someone no one thought possible. Some of those Davenport children were said to be retarded. Yet when moved to another institution to live with grown women, also said to be retarded, something happened that no one predicted nor understood. The children's intelligence became normal. How come? I hope to find the answer to that question. Searching the Iowa psychologist's research papers, letters, notes, memos, <clears throat> and later magazine and newspaper accounts of their work, I discovered that behind every assessment and investigation, one factor emerged as pivotal. The Iowa researchers had challenged the eugenic dogma called IQ constancy. The idea that no matter what their experience or educations, children's intelligence resembled their parents and could not change. Yet those results were almost entirely based on studies of children who lived in stable families and attended ordinary schools. But the Iowa psychologists studied institutionalized children whose environments were less stable than most children's. Their living conditions were well below accepted children's norms and childcare norms, with many changes of staff, locations, and circumstances. Looking more deeply, the Iowa psychologists discovered <clears throat> that if children's living conditions changed, their IQs also changed. No other psychologist found those results because no other psychologist went into the institutions and studied what happened to the children who lived there. 
Eugenics is pernicious, not only because its claims lack any empirical support, it's pernicious because it's so easy to justify those claims based on evidence we find around us and to discount what doesn't fit. A phenomenon called confirmation bias, that is, we pay attention to what we expect to see. In an age dominated by eugenic beliefs, <clears throat> which assumed that children like Davenport or Davenport's orphans were born inferior, the Iowans' investigations took those environmental factors seriously. In doing so, they accomplished something they never set out to do. They upended ideas of social and cognitive trait inheritance. To help us understand how eugenics works, Mary Bennett will read the episode that begins our story and tells of a needy, probably homeless, young woman's encounter with Iowa's 1930 medical establishment. The young woman who presented herself for indigent maternity care at Iowa City's University of Iowa Hospital on May 7, 1934, appeared confused and gave the nurses two first names and four last names because she would not or could not say which were really hers. The hospital officials chose for her. And in Iowa's public records, she is Viola Hoffman. Hoffman could provide so little information about herself that her file did not include how far she had gone in school or even her age. As a matter of routine, the hospital asked women like Hoffman for permission to test their IQs. Because of her unfortunate mental state, it's hard to know whether Hoffman understood what an IQ test was or that if she had a poor result, she might be institutionalized and sterilized. Although she consented to the test, she may have realized that with her low social status, she was in no position to refuse. This is how it happened that one day for about an hour, Hoffman sat in a sparsely furnished hospital office with a psychologist who asked her question after question, many containing concepts that in her condition, she might've had difficulty grasping. For example, she was asked to consider contrasting ideas, the difference between laziness and idleness, between poverty and misery, character and reputation, and evolution and revolution. If she correctly answered three out of four of these, Hoffman's IQ would have been assessed in the average range. In another test, she had to mentally compute arithmetic problems. And yet another designed to test memory, she had to repeat a series of seven digits forward and then backward, and then do the same with another series, and then another. Hoffman's test result of 66 indicated that her IQ was well below the average range of 90 to 109. And her diagnosis, Moranism, became part of her official state of Iowa file. During this period, the terms moron, imbecile, and idiot were official identifiers for individuals who IQ test scores fit certain numerically low intelligence categories. Intelligence tests were first published in America between 1910 and 1916, and soon became tools in the mainstream public policy create, crusade called eugenics. Eugenicists believed that all human traits were biologically determined and inherited, and the problematic traits such as alcoholism, criminality, a tendency towards poverty, epilepsy, epilepsy insanity, and promis promis promiscuity, among others, resulted from low intelligence. Those who exhibited such traits could be institutionalized and sterilized, decisions often supported by IQ test score evidence. Designed to rid communities of the unfit, state governments and the educated class believed that the policies promoted a modern ideal, the creation of a society of the able to be achieved by improving the racial stock. A pioneer in the testing field, Lewis Terman of Stanford University called IQ tests a beacon of light for the eugenics movement. In addition, eugenicists promoted selective breeding, which encouraged the socially stable and well-educated to have larger families. In the service of eugenic goals, Medical doctors diagnosed those who might have problematic conditions such as epilepsy or alcoholism, and court officials had responsibilities for a diagnosis of criminality and sexual perversions, including prostitution. Claiming that IQ tests were scientific, mental test psychologists became America's acknowledged experts 
in the evaluation of the intelligence of persons accused of crimes, recruits in the United States Army, and those confined to institutions and hospital patients like Hoffman. By the end of the 1920s, nearly all states had passed laws permitting the involuntary sterilization of those with low intelligence, most of them poor, most of them women. For some, sterilization may have been a choice freely made, but for others, particularly women of low social status, the power distance between those who designated for the procedure and the medical or court officials made refusal difficult. Before her baby's birth, doctors informed Hoffman that her delivery would be by cesarean section. Although the reasons for this are not included in her case history, when she learned that the decision of, of that decision, she asked to be sterilized. Because she was now considered feeble-minded, a state guardian was appointed to sign her sterilization consent. Iowa was one of the few states that required consent. It is impossible to know whether sterilization was coercively suggested to Hoffman or whether she directly requested it. Either way, for her doctor, it would have been a routine procedure. From the perspective of most ordinary people, human ability and success were determined by genetics and not environment and accounted for the superiority of the middle class and upper class whites. Therefore, Hoffman's sterilization would have been viewed as beneficial to society and to Hoffman itself. It would free her from the burden of raising a child whose dissenting traits and unfortunate heredity would lead to a hopeless life. Better to prune the withering branch of the genetic tree. In July, after Hoffman delivered a normal baby boy, who she named Wendell, her mental state deteriorated further. Although she took care of her newborn son, she was unaware that she was his mother. Her hallucinations increased and she stopped keeping herself clean. Six weeks later, doctors diagnosed her as insane and committed her Clorinda, an Iowa State Hospital for the Mentally Ill. Not considered by authorities who evaluated her were the traumatic events that occurred during her pregnancy when her husband, who had already been married three times, divorced and abandoned her. Hoffman's appearance of mental illness may have been related to antepartum depression, that is depression that occurs during pregnancy. Along with postpartum depression, both conditions are recognized today as treatable with psychotherapeutic and medical interventions. With his mother institutionalized, Wendell spent his first year in, at a Des Moines juvenile center. In the summer of 1935, when her son was one year old, Iowa declared Viola Kaufman cured of mental illness and released her to the care of a sister in Chicago. The state would have permitted Hoffman to resume custody of her son, but instead she chose to relinquish her parental rights. During the Great Depression, a divorced mother with a history of mental illness would have faced insurmountable economic and social barriers to finding work and successfully caring for herself. Officials therefore transferred Wendell, now a ward of the state, 170 miles east to the nursery at Davenport's home, Iowa's principal state-run orphanage. As you heard in Mary's reading, during her time at the University of Iowa Hospital, the course of Viola Hoffman's life and her son's were shaped by eugenic policies. But who authored those policies? And how did eugenicists become the referees of intelligence and character in America? Many of the eugenicists in our story were highly respected academics, often psychologists, who held positions that carried much prestige. Perhaps the most notable was the head of Stanford University's psychology department, Lewis Madison Terman. Terman produced one of the most widely used intelligence tests in America, the Stanford Binet. As a matter of fact, it is still used today. Here's Lewis Terman at, in his office at, the, at Stanford. Terman claimed with no evidence that the IQ test was scientific and became admired for his test's ability based on IQ scores to decide who should be institutionalized or sterilized. Following a 1927 Supreme Court decision called Buck versus Bell, <clears throat> nearly all states passed laws um, permitted st permitting sterilization and institutionalization of those with low intelligence. Hoffman was a textbook case 
of such a person. When Hoffman asked to be sterilized, her request was viewed as desirable for society, <clears throat> implicitly for the superior white society, better to prune the withering branch of the genetic tree. But there were Americans who thought differently. And one of them, Des Moines, Iowa matron, Cora Bussy Hillis, dramatically changed the equation. Mary Bennett will read to us more about the significant but unrecognized Cora Bussy Hillis. Born in 1858, Cora Bussy Hillis was in her early 20s when her mother died, and she assumed the care of her disabled younger sister who could not walk and was shut out of participation in many activities. Although doctors had little hope for her sister's recovery, Hillis searched for therapies to support her return to health and eventually helped her attend college and enjoy a productive life. From this lesson, Hillis, the daughter of a Civil War Brigadier General and now married with her own family, became deeply interested in child welfare and development. When she tragically lost three of her five young children to accident and illness, Hillis recognized that as with her sister, not even doctors had the necessary information to keep young children healthy and safe. From that terrible awareness, Hillis defined her life's mission, the establishment of a center that would give the normal child the same scientific study by research methods that we in Iowa give to crops and cattle. To support her goal, Hillis began a search for scientific theories of child development. He, she was amazed not by what she found, but there was nothing to find. Quote, I waded through oceans of stale theory written by bachelor professors or elderly teachers and discovered there was no well-defined science of child rearing. There were no standards. All the knowledge was theoretical and with no research basis. As she gained experience and contact, Hillis's mission became widely known. But when asked about her idea's origin, she would say, oh, it's in the air. She feared that if it were known that the concept came from a woman, what she called of humble origins, it would not be seriously considered. But Hillis was an innovator. She had an idea that no one before had considered, one she believed was God's work. In an effort to enlist advocates, she approached the University of Iowa, where four of its presidents barely heard her out before turning her down. One suggested that she apply herself to raising money for the campus carillon. Hillis also attempted to find support from the state's legislature, but in nearly 20 years, just six legislators agreed to speak with her. By 1917, just as Hillis's proposal had reached the brink of approval from the Iowa legislature, the United States entered World War I. Anticipating that the state's funds would now go to the war effort, at the last minute her campaign was rescued when local newspapers headlined, quote, that only 41 of 250 Iowa young men were sound enough to go to war. Hillis immediately took to those same newspapers to suggest that the rejected recruits had been brought up by mothers who relied on inherited traditions and the leadings of instinct because they lacked scientific information about how to raise fit children. Then Hillis placed a cartoon in the Des Moines Register advertising that Iowa spent more money on goats and hogs than on its own offspring. In response to that pressure, Hillis's bill finally was passed. Importantly, but not with a lot of fuss, Hillis, Seashores, University of Iowa President William H. Jessup, Iowa State Legislator, the Iowa Governor, along with 500,000 women's group supporters, had taken a stand on the side of environment's influence on development. Now chartered by the state, in 1917, Iowa's Child Welfare Research Station finally opened for business. Thanks so much, Mary, for reading that. Hillis may have said that her ideas were in the air, but they weren't. Hillis thought, as Mary said, like an innovator. If she were here today, she might be running a Silicon Valley startup. To fulfill her research plan, the Iowa Station hired experts in child health, nutrition, physical training, nursery school education, and psychology. Together, the four station psychologists altered the history of their profession. And you see here on your screen, um, a photo of the actual building in which the original Iowa Station was housed, um, right near the University of Iowa campus in Iowa City. Along with most psychologists of the time, 
three of the station psychologists had been trained traditionally and accepted, ex excuse me, and accepted the eugenic based concept of the unchanging IQ. Two were native Iowans, Beth Bowman, um, and Beth is the second woman from the left with a little girl sitting on her lap, and Harold Skeels down in the corner, who graduated from Iowa State in 1927. Um, Harold's major uh, in college uh, and his undergraduate work was um, in animal husbandry, and he studied the genetic, the genetics of various animals, and he prepared for a career where um, he would be influential in, uh, in giving ideas to those people who wanted to sell milk and produce and farmers, how to use their cattle and their farms um, to, to, come, to capitalize on the genetics that, that, that he had discovered. However, how, how Harold didn't stay an in animal husbandry and for reasons we don't understand, he decided to become a psychologist and joined the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station to get his PhD. Beth had majored in education and she went to the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station um, and became the, uh, while she was a student, became to get her PhD, became the secretary to its head, um, who was a widower. Eventually they became engaged. Um, further, the third, Marie Skodak, was a graduate student at Iowa State, and she was mentored by the renowned eugenicist authority, Henry Goddard. He was the author of the, an internationally acclaimed eugenic treatise called The Kallikak Family. Only the fourth of these psychologists, George Stoddard from Pennsylvania, who briefly trained at the Sorbonne with a colleague of Alfred Benet's, believed development was influenced by a child's environment. At the, as the head of the Iowa Station, Stoddard encouraged, but never insisted, that his colleagues investigate environment's role. In 1933, the state of Iowa mandated IQ tests for all its institutionalized children. Because of overcrowding, two very retarded little girls were stuffed um, into, shuffled, excuse me, were shuffled to another institution where they lived with adult women who were also retarded. This was not an experiment. This was just a matter of need. Um, the Davenport had become so crowded. They wanted to take some children out of Davenport and move them to another place just to, to lower the caseload. But when the psychologists later tested the two children, they discovered the impossible. Their intelligence had become normal. To see whether this would happen again, the psychologists moved still more retarded children to another institution where the children were also cared for by retarded women. They found that these children also regained their intelligence. What was going on here? In both situations, the women provided attentive, affectionate care, something these children had not had at Davenport. In fact, at Davenport, no one touched them, no one held them, no one talked to them, no one taught them anything. They were really children raising themselves. Now normal, the children could be adopted. Such spectacular results could not be ignored and were even reported in Time Magazine, which wrote, illegitimate children of feeble-minded mothers and laboring fathers, after being placed in good homes, turned out to be bright children. But apparently normal youngsters kept in an overcrowded orphanage deteriorated. After many more studies, in 1938-1939, the Iowans published research showing that when children's environments changed, so did their IQs. But they were unprepared for the firestorm their own profession ignited against them 
for those ideas. The brutal attack was led by Lewis Terman, <clears throat> who in 1913 had said, the IQ test he was producing would allow the segregation of the feeble-minded, which is sure to follow the further use of intelligence tests. It will, besides aiding in the elimination of degeneracy, remove a demoralizing and retrograding influence from the lives of many normal children who are compelled to associate with feeble-minded children either in the home or in the school. In Terman's 1923 inaugural address as the head of the American Psychological Association, he announced that his IQ test had been given to 2 million World War I soldiers and several million children, and had changed the public's view of psychologists from harmless cranks to scientists of human engineering and was reshaping the national policy on immigration. Around that time, Charles Davenport and Harry Laughlin at Cold Spring Harbor's eugenics record office were leading eugenicists eugenic attacks against immigrants. Between 1890 and 1920, 20 million immigrants had come to the United States from Central, Southern, and Eastern Europe. And those immigrants had very much excited the um, eugenicist backlash against them. They promoted a blizzard of eugenics focused radio coverage, newspaper and, and magazine articles, public lectures and conferences, YMCA programs, museum installations, and community celebrations, such as church picnics featuring eugenicist speakers. Here, can we go back to that other slide? Mayan, is that possible? Uh, the one before with the, the young women, Anyway, the, the slide before this show these young women working at the eugenics records office. These women were recruited from all over the country and trained to go into the community and ask questions of people about their traits and their families and their neighbors. And from that, they collected over a million three by five index cards, um, which they kept at the eugenics records office. When the uh, eventually the eugenics records office was closed down, um, those cards were said to be worthless for any academic study. This um, slide you're seeing now has eugenics, um, the study of human inheritance, and it has these uh, supposedly scientific um, posters and uh, showing inheritance and how traits are inherited. None of this had scientific basis for humans. It had scientific basis for, for uh, pea plants, which is where the ideas came from. Um, a, a friar in Eastern Europe had done a lot of research on pea plants, and he um, saw how the, inherit, how the traits of color in the pea plant flowers were inherited. And eugenicists took those ideas and they assumed they also held for humans, which they absolutely did not. Eventually, there would be hundreds of college courses on eugenics, including at Harvard, Columbia, and Princeton, in which eugenic science was taught to thousands of students. Another American eugenicist, Madison Grant, published a best-selling 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, which identified a master race, here's Madison Grant, uh, called Aryans. If that sounds familiar, it should. This is the word that Hitler used to, dis to describe the people who were superior uh, and who he wanted to make the center of Germany. Grant became known as America's most influential racist and Hitler called Grant, Grant's book, his Bible. The book was used by Nazis in their defense at the Nuremberg trials. In 1933, an item on the agenda, and remember 1933 is the year when Hitler was elected 
Chancellor of Germany. In 1933, an, an item on the agenda of a White House conference on child health and protection held in Des Moines suggested that retarded children should be euthanized. The report wrote, public sentiment does not as yet permit the elimination of these unfortunates, even when their mere existence is obviously of no value to anyone, including the unfortunates themselves. Was any of that era's racist and classist eugenic onslaught directed at Iowa's black population, who were at the time less than 1% of Iowa's population? During the Civil War, some formerly enslaved persons took refuge in the Southwest town of Amity, where there had been an underground railway station. <clears throat> By 1930, many of Iowa's African-Americans lived in Eastern Iowa's Mississippi River towns, one of which is Davenport. In that year, there were 685 African-Americans in Scott County where Davenport is located, about 5% of Iowa's population. Mary Bennett scholarship notes that in the 1930s, Federal Population Census for Iowa found seven African-American boys and five African-American girls under the age of one, of one living in Davenport households. In my research, I scoured every report about the Iowa Station studies of Davenport children for mention of black or black, black children or black families. I found none. This seemed implausible. Was it an omission of mention, but not an absence of fact? Were black children living at Davenport, but due to constant eugenic declarations, were they, were they just not noted? Or were they excluded as subjects from studies due to racist bias? Further, my Davenport's small black community have decided as Mary Bennett suggested to me to care for their needy children through African-American churches, which would act as agents. Mistrusting the white establishment, had the black community set up its own facilities or was eugenic dogma so alarming that the black population chose to stay far from its reach? Would the African-American population have trusted Iowans to treat them fairly? Would they have known that in several significant instances, wide majorities of Iowans rejected eugenic assumptions outright as when they awarded popular and legislative approval for the development of the Iowa station. One thing is clear, the language and ideology of eugenics echoes today in attacks in America and worldwide that revile Asians and Jews and others, and are especially focused on black and brown people. The investigations at the Iowa Welfare Station went forward despite eugenicists' severe criticisms. Its research represented one of the only challenges from American psychology to eugenic ideology. Beth Wellman showed that young children's IQs rose significantly when they attended preschool for a full rather than half day. She also found that IQs declined during the summer vacations, but rebounded after children completed another school year. And she showed that intelligence gains from nursery school showed up much later in higher college admissions test scores. Harold Skeel showed that 13 children who lived in the Davenport home where they had no toys, where no adults took an interest in them, where they were not even toilet trained, and where they became retarded, experienced revived IQs when they lived with attentive, affectionate, retarded women who provided consistent 
responsive care. 11 of those children became normal and were adopted. So their lives were utterly changed. And Maurice Skodak discovered that about 200 children of intellectually limited birth parents who were adopted between two and six months of age into middle-class homes developed IQs in the superior range. Skodak was the first to report that the earlier a child received stimulation, the higher their intelligence. Also required, she said, was an abundant use of language, a high level of cognitive stimulation, and stable, emotionally rich human connections. In the 1960s, Skeels and Skodak tracked down every child from their studies, and to their surprise and amazement, they found the children's IQ gains had persisted into their adulthood. They did not think that would happen. <clears throat> what Iowa researchers understood was that the IQ changes they witnessed had to have happened at the cellular, that is the brain level, something no one else at the time suggested and which they could not prove. Charles Nelson's 2007 neuroscience studies of Romanian orphans now show the Iowans were right. A singularity was the way scholar Hamilton Cravens of Iowa State described the Iowa station. There was nothing like it in the US and maybe not in the world. He suggested that Lewis Terman and others assaults on these new ideas were strikes against the egalitarian ideology of the Iowans, which had explosive, he said, implications for the distribution of status, power, wealth, and justice in society. While the, well, the, while the Iowans' 1930s work was groundbreaking, the bitter storming against it echoed for decades. Not until the 1960s were the Iowans' radical findings recognized by their own profession. But when they were, psychology finally entered its modern age. Thank you, Marilyn. We will now begin the Q&A session. Yes, we're gonna start with a really big question. Uh, what did you leave out of the story? I could write five more books on what I left out of the story. I didn't tell a lot about the women um, who took care of these children because I couldn't get their records. Um, they were in a state institution and you can't just go uh, and be given records of people who are labeled retarded from state institutions. And I would love, love to know more about them. Uh, I also did not, uh, there are people I haven't mentioned today. Um, one of them is a man named Simon Oster. He's in the book and he worked with Skeels and I found him and met him uh, and interviewed him several times. I would have loved to hear even more about his experiences with Harold Skeels. Um, I also did not talk a lot about the lack of science um, that permeated this um, era. And uh, for example, Lewis Terman, when he was uh, in college and then in graduate school, he did not want to take any science courses. This was a man who went out and publicly said that eugenics was scientific. He had no idea what he was talking about. Um, so uh, those are just a few of the questions uh, and things that I didn't explore. We have a few more questions here. Good. Um, how did you know there was something worth researching before you delved into the Iowa studies? Okay, this is, um, you know, you never know what the next bend in your life is gonna be, right? Um, I mean, aren't we in a pandemic? Did we know that? Um, so I, um, 
I had a lifelong friend who passed away a few years ago, um, who, who was, and we knew each other our, our entire lives. And he became a world renowned biologist. And because he went to study biology for his doctorate at Rockefeller University, he encountered someone who's in my book, um, Alfred Mursky. And Alfred had a nephew who had in the 50s had done his doctoral work at the University of Iowa. And he heard from the people in Iowa about this story. And he brought the story back to Uncle Alfred. And Uncle Alfred told my friend, and I, although I knew this person, um, Eric Davidson is his name, I knew him almost my whole life. He never mentioned this to me. I don't know why he didn't, but he didn't. So when I came to Harvard's Graduate School of Education, I began to study early development. And uh, one time I was with Eric and I told him what I was studying and what the science was of the brain development in young children. And he got this funny look on his face. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, you know, Alfred told me this story about these children in Iowa who lived in an institution, became retarded, and then um, they went to live with women who were retarded and they became normal. And I looked at him, I said, that's not possible. I'm a psychologist and I never heard that story. And so I said, oh, wow, this is, if it's true, which I didn't really believe, this is really interesting. The interest, I came, came back, I was on a vacation in, in California and, and I came back to Harvard and I asked my professors, Jack Schoenkopf, who's the head, who's a friend now, a friend of mine, but who's the head of the Center on the Developing Child. And I said, Jack, did you ever hear about this? And he looked at me funny and he said, oh yeah. Um, Hmm, I think I know a little bit about that, but you know, nobody's paying attention to it. I said, that was great because if nobody was paying attention to it, it meant the, the, the road was open for me. And um, I just started digging into it. So that's how I found that out. Um, in fact, the part about how did Alfred hear about it and, and about his um, nephew coming back and telling him, I learned very accidentally in an archive, um, someone who was running the archive knew this guy. His name was Lou Lipset. And he said, you know, you might want to talk to Lou Lipset because he knows something about this. So I, Lou is at Brown and I'm in Cambridge. So we had lunch and uh, he told me he's the one who told Alfred. So, you know, these are just accidents. Um, and I was the lucky recipient of them. There's more, but we can go on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question. Are there still true believers in eugenics out there in the academic world? Absolutely. Or has that been laid to rest by the well, government? I don't know about the academic world. I, I haven't researched that. Um, there are certainly true believers of, of eugenics. Um, have, you know, in, in anybody's family, don't they say, oh, you know, he, he talks just like his father. She tells jokes just like her cousin, you know, and people build on that and think, okay, this is, it's inherited. Um, and some may be, there, there may be some truth to that, but what the eugenicists didn't do and don't understand is the role of environment. Environment is um, absolutely um, at least 50%. Let me give you another example. The, our inheritance of genes and, in, and, in, and our inheritance of intelligence comes from about a thousand genes, a thousand. Each of those genes is subject to our internal environment, our health, um, our, our diet, our activities, our illnesses, 
but also it's subject to um, things we don't can't even predict or in, in understand. That's the internal environment. Then each person is subject to an external environment. I don't know if anybody's read this research that's been um, coming out lately about children in the pandemic having lower intelligence. It's all over the place. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, it doesn't seem, seem very sound to me, but there are some people, and one of them is at Brown, who thinks that's true. And that the children aren't getting externally, they aren't getting enough um, uh, stimulation because their parents, if they're at home, their parents are too busy working. And if they're, and they can't be going to their schools uh, in many cases, um, and the, the lack of environmental stimulation could be, they could be paying a price for that. Um, so we don't know that. But yeah, there's still a lot of people who tend to think that eugenics is the name of the game. Um, you know, when, when you read about eugenics, eugenics and what eugenicists think, um, there are a lot of people, there are people like that. There are some scientists um, who, who think this is true um, and who have been chasing genes um, to, to show that it's true and they haven't been successful. So, um, and today you can chase genes for a long time and get a lot of information. So I don't know where that's gonna go. Thank you. Uh, someone writes, I'm scarcely an advocate of intelligence tests, but you keep using the phrase, while well, the child was actually intelligent, George Sto uh, Stoddard was very intelligent, etc." So you're using the same term, but substituting your own um, informal cr criteria. How do you respond to this question? That's a really good question. No one can define intelligence. It has never really been defined. Um, and this is a brief talk. In my book, I talk a lot about uh, Stoddard, for example, as a great example, um, of his quest to know things. Um, he had a reading library that was um, really very impressive. He, he read voraciously and he read all kinds of books. He read in science, he read in literature. He read um, in the arts. So, and people who talked with him reported on the sharpness of his arguments. He worked for, for example, Governor Dewey in New York. When Dewey was a, um, the governor and Dewey was a very sharp guy himself. And uh, in, a, in a book that Stoddard wrote, he talks about the back and forth that he would have with Dewey about education and about children and about environment. And Dewey just came to really, really admire his, his daughter's intellect. So, and, and I read that in a lot of places. So if I could talk to somebody today who isn't around for us anymore, Stoddard would be one of those people. These people are almost like, uh, I know so much about them that I almost feel like they're part of my family. But um, uh, he, but, but that's why I would say that about Stoddard. Uh, when you talk about children and you talk about intelligence tests, what are you really saying? Um, you know, those intelligence tests, intelligence tests or IQ, or IQ tests um, don't really tell us a lot about who the child is. And today, that's not really a good uh, method uh, to, know, to know the intelligence of a child. It's really almost impossible to know that from those kinds of tests. If you ever read those tests, you'll see that what they really contain are pieces of the culture that have been taken and put into the test. But, you know, as... Um, I mentioned Alfred Binet a little while ago in, in Paris. Alfred Binet was a French psychologist and he believed in environment. And he would ask, 
children questions. And in his writing, he said once, he said, some of those children didn't even, they lived in Paris. They had never seen the Seine. How, what, what are we learning about their environment here that is so limited? So intelligence is a mystery, I think, still. Um, I was at a conference, an academic conference, a couple of years ago, and somebody asked me, so Marilyn, what is intelligence? How do, you know, how do you define it? And I said to him, it's what's on the test. And that's not an answer. I mean, really, it's not. So, um, and, and really what I would, and he said, other people have said that to me too. I said, well, that's because we don't know what intelligence really is. Look at the artist versus the engineer. I mean, look at those two different ways those minds work. We know so much more today about how minds work and we still don't understand intelligence. If that helps, I don't know if it does. It's a good question though, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we probably have enough time for one more question. Okay. Um, thank you for writing this important book. In addition to reading your book, I also want to expand my reading a little. Any seminal work that you use that you can point us or recommend? Hmm. Um, but that is a hard question because there's really nothing much out there about what I'm telling you, um, which made it really a, a, an important book to write. Um, I would say the history of learning would, was one place I went. Um, what did people know about learning in the time I was writing about? During the time I was writing this book, I, the only reading I would do had to do with that time period and that location. If I could find something in that location, but I certainly stayed in that time period. And I found um, that there was not, I couldn't get enough information about how people learned things in that day. They were starting to do those investigations, but that's the kind of research that I did. And um, it helped me, but it wasn't the answer. There really wasn't an answer, but you can read Binet, um, Alfred Binet. He's a terrific writer. And he wrote a lot about how children learn or he, how he thought they learned. Um, so that would be another person to look at. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Marilyn and Mary, for joining us today. Uh, this was really a uh, fascinating uh, book talk, and I hope people uh, uh, are inspired to learn more about it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.